We're going to start with this question. We've gotten this question a couple of times in a couple of different ways, but I think this is a, actually to compare the two. Uh, BWV5014 at the on, uh, on three Blue White Illustrated message board says, how would you compare this team to 2016? What are the similarities and key differences that you see? Um, Fitz, do, do you, we've talked about the first month of the season being prepared, how it kind of was off to a rough start, but then ended magically for Penn State. Um, not necessarily in that, but like, where do you see the strengths of this team as compared to 2016 and vice versa? Uh, they got star power at running back. That's a good one to start with. I think that you can go with that and, and sort of, um, you know, in the college game, it's, it's all about scoring points. All right. So, um, I, I would start there and say the big play capability in the run game is, is huge. Like, especially breaking in a new quarterback as they did in 2016, give that give them a little bit more time to breathe and the fact that you have singleton uh, a more experienced offensive line i think is huge um mm -hmm. you know katron allen is also awesome like don't get me wrong here but nick singleton is the big play guy and can be can be an eraser we talk about erasers on the defensive side of the ball so often um you know those guys that come along and and just sort of uh break the curve um and i think nick singleton can be one of those guys so i'll go with that with the, with the 2016 team that sort of jumps out to me i'm sorry uh we just confirmed another official visit so i haven't really been paying attention in the last couple of minutes but uh yeah so um oh my. check out the site check out the site for for more on that ryan's uh, working on that one right now um but yeah it's uh that that's where i would go is the fact that penn state has the ability to take the ball and and that's what it's, it was missing a couple of years ago take the ball from anywhere on the field and score a touchdown with the run game um you don't necessarily need um to throw the ball down the field as much you don't necessarily 2016 team obviously had a lot of success with that um but you don't necessarily need that and i think that that's a great thing to look at and have the ability to uh, sort of just erase second and eight erase second yeah. and 11 something like that and go and go with that nate what do you think yeah i think uh the 2016 defense was not as good as this defense by a wide margin and mm -hmm. so that's like to me that's a, a pretty significant disparity and then the 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 question is 2016 had some studs at, at receiver Keandre has to be that like that's yep. that is a huge part of this is he has the opportunity to be that eraser as a receiver uh, and, and right. Because when, when we think back on that season on 2016, so much of Penn state's production, it's scoring production was predicated on home runs. I mean, that's yep. Trace yep. McSorley, his, his old thing with the, you know, uh, you know, that was all, <laughs> that was all about hitting home runs. And so, yeah, Penn state can do that with Nick Singleton. Absolutely. Katron Allen gives you the consistency in, in, in the backfield. I think that Theo Johnson has an opportunity to hit home runs as a tight end. I mean, that's a, that's a guy who can give you 30, 35 yard receptions yep. consistently. He can, he can do that for you, but can Keandre Lambert Smith, uh, you know, can some of those, can Trey Wallace, like uh, Evans, like can those guys create an opportunity for, 60 70 80 yard touchdowns I, I don't know but i mean certainly keandre has a little bit of a history of, of being able to do that he did it in the rose bowl he did it against michigan state he did it earlier yep. in the season last season uh it's about being able to to do that consistently and once you do if you do that that just gives you such a a, a threat at all times that scares defensive coordinators and you can take advantage of that so the thing that I find interesting is that the more I think about it, I think this is closer to the 2019 team than it is 2016 because the offensive line is better. The offensive line was pretty good in 2019. And that team was led by a strong running game and uh, they didn't have a lead receiver that was like a workhorse like Chris Godwin. They had guys that were, you know, Jahan Dotson his first year, KJ Hamler was the team's leading receiver from the slot. And to me, like this is kind of what I wrote about earlier this week is where are your threats coming from? How do you balance the field? That team in 2019 arrived early. You know, that was a team that everyone said 2020, if that was a normal year and blah, yeah. blah, blah, that was going to be their year. But Jerry yep. Brown, explosive running back, Noah Kane uh, brought you the balance and the power. I think you can have a similar comparison, maybe even not maybe probably better than that when with the guys you have on this roster. Um, but the, the protection, that right tackle position, I'm still got my eye on it, but Overall, this offensive line is clearly a better uh, version of what they had in either 2016 or 19, at least on paper. 
Uh, Fitz, do you have a follow-up there? No, it's just funny to think about 2016 and we go through the roster and, and that there's, there's an argument to be made that that team had no business being as good as it was. Like yeah. there was, there's something to be said for belief. There's something to be said for uh, the way that Joe Moorhead was able to just turn things on its head so quickly. And obviously they had that first month of the season was not, not memorable by any stretch, but they turned it around and, you know, sort of found what they were best at and, and sunk into that. Like the, the, the talent one to 85 on this roster is, is I think better, but you, you know, you're missing some spots at receiver. You mentioned Godwin obviously was, was awesome. Yeah. was fantastic. So those certain spots where you have these top level guys, Penn state not necessarily has them on the 2023 roster, but from top to bottom, there's, there's more talent, there's more depth. Um, so it's kind of, kind of a flip flop there in terms of what, uh, what, what we do when we compare these teams side by side. Yeah, and, and and having um having enough threats, I think, is is kind of a thing that they do have pretty close to enough threats at all positions in in order to create those explosive plays and keep the defense off balance. One last thing I'll I'll, I'll point out is that that was Joe Moorhead's first season as the offensive coordinator. This is Mike Yurcich's second season. So on on the plus side they're going to be more comfortable in the offense. I'm sorry, this is the third season. Uh, on, and, but then, you know, teams know Penn State's offense now. They have a good idea of what it is and what it isn't. I think there was a little bit of Joe Moorhead and that offense really um, exploded on the scene because teams weren't necessarily ready for all of the things that they were able to do offensively. It's, it's like when you put a backup quarterback in the game and he looks yeah. fantastic. You're just not prepared for him. And then the next game he comes back and – Mike White five, throws five interceptions, for instance. So, <laughs> I think that that's that there is something to be said for catching someone off guard, and that's what that's what it's, that's why it's fun when you see these coordinators come up from a lower level and just you know you, some of these bigger programs are so not stuck in their ways, but they they use these methods, these tried and true methods that work, and sometimes you get caught off guard. So that's that would be a fun little wrinkle. But as you mentioned, third third year for Yersich, so we're going to see what what he's got in the tank and. Will this offense look the same as it did last year from a structural standpoint with a different style quarterback? Oh, we're we're going to find out. Poncho 570 asked, which one's going to be the bigger test at this point? Iowa at home or Illinois on the road? We've talked about this uh, a little bit back and forth, but in terms of actually like which game do you think is a more concerning, a more interesting matchup? Um, uh, Fitz, you were leaning pretty hard on that Illinois away game. Is that where you would go? Yeah, that's where I would go just because it's a it's a new uh, atmosphere for him to step into. And, you know, he's played on the road. It came in, did did admirably against Purdue last year. But that's a veteran coach who has um, controlled the game like in his own way. And that's that's going to be tough uh, to go to Illinois and win that game. I mean, I, I'll, I'll say this. I think it's I think the Illinois game uh, will be a tougher uh, a tougher draw and a tougher scenario. Not that necessarily uh, Illinois is better than Iowa. Um, because I'm not really sure what we're going to get with Iowa with the the retooled offense, uh, or the, at least the players that have come in and and uh, sort of taken over. But uh, I I would I would lean you know if there's a tiebreaker to be made on the road is the tiebreaker. You know the whiteout is going to give you an extra couple of points or something like that. So that's that's the way that I would go. Yeah, I, I think that's a a really good point there. I'll finish up, Nate. Uh, jump in here. Do you have a thought between home game? It's the whiteout game against Iowa, and then road against Illinois. Yeah, I would I would just say that uh, I, I don't uh, I don't know what the right word is. I don't like I, I don't know T- teams that can't score points or aren't designed to score points. I think are going to struggle uh, against Penn State. I just need to see Penn State score points first before I right like that. I mean that's yeah. that's the whole thing is uh, I, I think that this is a Penn State team that's going to score points. I think they're going to put up thirty five plus a game. Uh, can Illinois at Illinois, like, I don't really, I, when I look at those two games, I think the Penn state should win both by a couple of touchdowns in May Yeah, is, but, but uh, you, you gotta, you gotta actually put that out there. You have to, you have to put them up. You gotta put up those 40 points against West Virginia and Delaware, and then you can see where things go. But if this is a Penn state team that, that can't find that balance, if, teams don't have to respect the passing game and can focus all of their energies on stopping the run and bottling up Singleton and Catron Allen, then maybe that changes the dynamic a little bit, but uh, yeah, no, I think, I think both of those games are, are certainly clearly winnable. If Penn state can score points, this you, you brought up exactly what I was going to talk about. So this is an on three article from earlier this month, ranking the top five 
defensive lines in America. Number one is Georgia, according to on three. Uh, Michigan comes in number two. Illinois comes in at number three, followed by Penn State. So um, in a game on the road, if Nick Singleton is neutralized by a good defensive line that can gum up Penn State's running game and he doesn't break off an 80-yard run, and it then is on um, uh, Drew Aller to throw into tight single coverage because they are aggressive with that secondary. If it's on him on the road, this is the setup. This is why I agree with Fitz in terms of from a tactical and schematic standpoint. Uh, Iowa can present the same problems, right? So they can present the same problems. They can do those things uh, as well of stopping the run, being stout up front, and then having a, a, a really tough secondary to throw into with their zone coverages. Illinois, it's just, it's different. It's it's man coverage, it's press, it's aggressive, it's tight windows. It feels a little different, and sometimes it can be an absolute shutdown if you don't have guys like Keandre Lambert-Smith that can break that one-on-one -on -one matchup and get open and make those big plays, make it easy for the quarterback. So that's going to be fascinating because there's one thing Penn State has struggled with the last couple of years. It's been man coverage, separation from it. If you don't have a star receiver like a... Um, like a Jahan Dotson to make that a bad plan for a team. So yeah. I that's a great that that's going to be a great matchup. I think. Yeah, I think so. And like I said, good coaching staff there, and they they've lost a lot. Like there's no yes. there's no getting over. They've lost some really good players. Chase Brown's not going to be back, and Penn State is probably really happy to see that. Um, but uh, I, I I agree with Nate. Uh, are those points going to come? They've got a first year quarterback starter. I think Luke Alt Altmaier is going to be the guy uh, from Mississippi. Um, so they've got to basically get their offense up to speed as well. So it, it's not going to be a situation where you're going into um, a hostile environment with a team that's stacked up ready to make a run, but there's enough elements there that can make you concerned uh, given what you have on your side, given what they have on their side, and, and especially coaching there.